Hello, and welcome to episode 125 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Paradin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is, is retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Tech Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. How are you this afternoon, Bill? I'm doing great, Seth. I think, you know, people are going to get tired of hearing that intro. It's from <laughs> a, from <us. laughs> I need to come up with something new. <laughs> you know, maybe shorten it, but yeah. uh, really happy to be here to close out the Guadalcanal campaign, at least until we decide we need to revisit it at some future date. <laughs> Which I'm sure we will. I'm sure we, we will. will. Yeah. yeah, you know, and this is this is not our normal uh, structured episode. You know, there's a few things we want to talk about, a few loose ends mm -hmm. we want to tie up here before we do officially move on to another topic and or not topic but a new subject area within the pacific war but um you know we did a ton of episodes on guadalcanal uh, uh, mm -hmm. i mean a, a shipload of, of episodes on they guadalcanal just, they deserve it you do guadalcanal deserves it. It, and the it, soldiers and marines and sailors that fought there yeah it does and and you know even with all the episodes that we did and all the detail that we dove into all these different events you know there's still a lot of stuff we left out and including one naval battle in but that i know we're going to mm. talk about here in just a second but you know i mean there's a lot of stuff that we left out and there's no well i mean i guess you could cover it all but it would be the guadalcanal podcast not the pacific war podcast right and we don't want well, to volumes and volumes want. have been written by great people like richard frank and and you know geez there's so much been written about it there's no way we could cover it all i mean we've got more detail on this battle down to names and not just dates that certain events happen, but minute by minute accounts of what happened. And we've covered, I'd venture to say more than any other World War II podcast probably has about that campaign. Yeah, I don't know any that's done more on it than we have, but there's still a lot more. Oh, yeah. And if we don't, if we want to cover the rest of the war and not take 10 years to do it i think we are going to have to move on we do we do unfortunately and and you know it's because there is so there are so many cool personal stories to talk about you know uh, the pacific war in general period but especially mm -hmm. guadalcanal i mean i refer back to our episode on santa cruz you know while that's a pivotal naval battle there were so many cool personal stories that were involved in that event that it's it's you want to share them. You know, you have to share mm -hmm. them because I venture to guess that 95 percent of the people that watched that episode or listened to it, however you took it in. You'd never heard of those names before. William Pinckney, no. you know, Sweet Vettiza you might have heard of, but Clayton Fisher, nobody ever heard of Clay Fisher. You know, so it's it's all important. And and as we progress through the rest of the war, you know, I know that we're going to focus on that and 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 we're going to focus and we're going to talk about what we're going to focus on here at the end of this episode, too. But mm -hmm. to, to wrap up the Guadalcanal campaign, you know, our last episode that we did with Dave, we talked about um, the the final Marine Corps actions, offensive actions, the final, well, first and final Army offensive actions on, on Guadalcanal and, and how those played out or, or, you know, for better or worse. But, you know, there was still there was one naval action uh, that we have yet to cover and we'll cover briefly here. I know you wanted to talk about it, Bill. Let, Battle of Tassafaranga. Yeah. Now, the reason I think it's important to talk about it is because, you know, Pearl Harbor obviously is the greatest naval disaster and you know loss in the United States Navy history in terms of tonnage and a whole bunch of other reasons. Number two would be Savo, which we've already covered in a pre previous episode. Arguably number three is Tassafaranga, which happens at the end of November, November 30th, 1942. So we're not even a year into the war yet. And we've had these three gut punches in the United States Navy. So I do believe it's important that people understand why Tassafaranga is such a critical issue. From a tactical, remember, you're the historian, I'm the Navy guy, <laughs> 26 years on active duty. And you know, I always want to look at these things from that perspective. You know the names of all these brave Americans that fought that I, I, I couldn't recite their names. I'm so glad that you can. But in Tassafaranga, the United States Navy loses 
And if you want a circle, put a circle around why, because of one decision of the admiral in command. And for, for Navy people, that's the lesson you should take away from this battle. But we could go into detail, to, to some detail. I don't think we need to stretch this out very long, Seth. Yeah. You know, if you look at the, the way that, that naval battles off of Guadalcanal, and I'm talking surface battles here, were fought, and the massive, the, the large chunk of casualties that the Americans suffered in terms of not necessarily, I'm not even talking people here, I'm just talking about ships, ship casualties, shipping casualties. They were inflicted mm -hmm. by really, really one main weapon. I'm not saying that gunfire didn't sink American ships because it did, but the main weapon that sunk most American ships off the coasts. Long lance torpedo. That's what exactly. You're <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Right. One We've friggin' thing, the long lance torpedo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, finest yeah. torpedo in the world, finest torpedo of the war uh, from any side. And you would think mm -hmm. that after having been on the receiving end of multiple long lance torpedoes and at the form in the form of, you know, Savo Island, uh, Naval Battle of Guadalcanal, the Friday the 13th battle, you know, Cape Esperance, even, you know, that we would have maybe built up a respect for these weapons and and, and mm -hmm. i'm not even saying necessarily the torpedo but the destroyers uh that launched the majority of them cruisers had them too but um that's not the case of what happens at tassa you know it this is it's an if you look at the order of battle for tassa it should be as you said before we started recording it should be an overwhelming american victory i mean Absolutely. we had we had what six destroyers five or uh, three heavy cruisers four heavy yeah, cruisers heavy two heavy cruisers and two light cruisers i think we had the minneapolis and the new orleans oh three i'm sorry you're right yeah minneapolis new orleans and pensacola were the heavy cruisers and then honolulu and northampton were the light cruisers but no 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 northampton was a heavy cruiser too oh, but, you're right that's right. but but even still i mean that's a overwhelming fire superiority against one two three four five six seven eight eight Japanese destroyers. I mean, if you look at the gunfire, I mean, there should be no contest as to what's happening, where and with whom. And you're also talking about the usage of, you know, our old friend radar. We talked about this, you know, in several mm -hmm. episodes, F sprints, uh, Friday the 13th, you know, Ching Lee's fight with the Japanese, at, uh, you know, on Washington, you know, all the radar that's that's involved in this. Well, ship shoot out, yeah. yeah, but this is just a a cluster and i won't use the and second word but this is a important mess. because we knew by this point in the war how good the long lance was and we knew we were having troubles with our torpedoes and so because of that you know the, the, when the japanese really cleaned our clock they had the element of surprise in every case except this one mm -hmm. in this one we had the element of surprise yep. and we really, really needed it to make sure that that, because the long lance torpedo, that the advantage didn't shift back to the Japanese, despite our element of surprise. Mm -hmm. We had intel that they were coming. We had the radar. We had the larger number and heavier shipping, you know, Navy ships. Guns, yeah. And we still lost. Yeah, big time too. It, it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. even close. So on November the 30th, as you were saying, 1942, <clears throat> the Japanese are trying to execute another a resupply mission to Guadalcanal. These fast destroyers are running into Guadalcanal, and this it's it's almost comical the way they were trying to resupply their people here. You know, they'd take fuel drums and load they them. They were desperate. With, yeah, they would take fuel drums and load them with supplies and basically kick the fuel drums off the side of the DDs and hope to Christ that they, they were would carry. Together. Yeah, they, were, they had enough air in them so they would float right. and they were tied together with ropes and the destroyers would kind of drag them along and then turn really hard and cut them loose and they would, their momentum would carry them inshore. And then somebody from the Imperial Japanese Army that was on the island was supposed to swim out, grab the rope, pull it back or pull the rope back enough so they get a bunch of guys to haul these things ashore. This is a tactic of desperation to yep. resupply the Japanese army. Yep. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And this is one of those mm -hmm. times. And so on the, the night of November 30th, there is a resupply column 
column, resupply task force, under the command of Rear Admiral Rezo Tanaka. We've mentioned his name numerous times. Uh, this is the guy that was in charge of almost every resupply mission that was sent to Guadalcanal. He's a destroyer mastermind, as you will rapidly see. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, he's got eight destroyers under his command. At 2240 hours, Tanaka ships passed south of Savo Island, and they entered the area, the unloading area, and started to do that very thing. They started to unload their, their fuel drums of food and ammunition and medical supplies. supplies and, yeah. yeah. Um, the destroyer Takanami was standing guard essentially as these unloading operations were going on. Um, now remember this is nighttime, but it's, it's a relatively clear night. Um, at about the same time, task force 67, which is the American column or the American force under the command of Carlton Admiral Carlton Wright. This is a name you hear one time and one time only. And there's a reason for that. Um, <laughs> it enters the area at the same at roughly the same time as the japanese are beginning to unload at 2306 so this is only about 20 minutes later 25 minutes later uh admiral wright's force detects tanaka's force on radar you would yeah. think at that point now granted they're far away they're about they're about 20,000 yards away but still they know that they're there it's very evident that there's a japanese force there and you know and this is the kind of thing though that Ching Li was so good at that clearly Carlton Wright was not because this is a maneuvering problem. So he properly put his destroyers in, in front of the main column and the tactic was going to be get a salvo of torpedoes out there in the water before anybody knows we're there. Mm -hmm. And that's all good. And so the destroyers were properly positioned, ready to fire, and the destroyer squadron commander was actually a commander and CEO of one of the ships. Radios for permission to launch his torpedo salvo, which should never have happened, right? So it's right. screw up number one. But the, the admiral, Admiral Wright, says, oh, no, you're too far away. Don't fire yet. Now, admirals should not be making, giving orders like that. Mm -hmm. It's up to the tactical commander who's operating the weapon system to descend when to decide when the fire control solution is appropriate to the need. And in this case, what the Admiral failed to understand, the guys like Admiral Lee did, and this Admiral Wright couldn't, is that this is a maneuvering problem. So the Japanese are closing from from the north, the Americans are closing, and the torpedoes aren't being fired at the Japanese ships but at an intercept point where the Japanese ships will be like the old Wayne Gretzky joke. I, I don't, I don't skate to the puck. I skate to where the puck will be not a joke. True. Sure. So that you, you shoot the torpedoes to where the ships are, will be not to where they are. And the ships were going pretty fast and Admiral Wright decides, Oh no, don't fire those torpedoes yet. They're too far away. Right. He failed to understand they weren't too far away. Right. He, they were firing at the, the impact point, not the ships themselves. Correct. And by delaying that firing order, it was just a matter of minutes. I think it was, he delayed it once for two minutes and then after another two minutes, so maybe four minutes total, he delays the order to fire, it's too late. Yep. Those ships are going to open up past that intercept point and the torpedoes are going to miss. And that's precisely what happens at 20. Remember, I said at 2306, the radar picks them up, picks the Japanese up at 2312. And we've talked about the Japanese night optics and their lookouts, and their fantastic lookouts before. No need to do it again here. But at 2312, so this is only six minutes later, the Japanese visually sight writes column approaching um at 2316 four minutes after they're visually sighted admiral rezo tanaka ordered the unloading preparations halted and quote all ships attack so this is boom mm -hmm. within minutes and to your point bill at 2315 so a minute before tanaka gives that order commander william cole is the commander of one of wright's destroyers on uh, is the captain of the uss fletcher which is the lead ship of the famous fletcher class 
he requests order or requests permission to launch torpedoes to which you know right goes through this whole debacle which you just mm -hmm. you know related the the fact that he waits to give the order and then and finally does give the order at that point they are out of range and it's just it's the american torpedo attack which probably would have been i don't want to say how successful because our torpedoes suck but you know it more than likely would have scored at least one or two hits is yeah. is essentially would have done gone. damage and certainly interrupted the maneuver um tactics of the japanese at least it would have caused them to they would have interfered with their ability to rapidly fire their torpedoes and you know, without maneuvering and things like that to avoid the incoming torpedoes so as we're but, go ahead go ahead no, what I was going to say is the way it ends up turning out is that, you know, we receive massive damage. Yes. And this is one of the first, and I know, no, like this happened earlier in the war. There's a, there's several incidents during the war when our cruisers get hit and lose their bows. Yeah. I believe the New Pensacola, New Orleans, um, both lost their bow when they were hit by either torpedoes or gunfire during, during this battle. Yeah, this is something we talked about. So so just to take a one step back, you know, as we do cite the Japanese destroyer Takanami, that's the destroyer that that is, you know, illuminated by American star shells. We don't use searchlights like the Japanese did. We're firing star shells. As the star shells, American destroyers fire star shells and illuminate the Takanami. She's taken under fire by the American cruiser column. And we light her up. We do we do attack her and send her down. However, what the American cruiser column does not know, or well, they know radar, but they don't see it visually, is that the rest of Tanaka's column is maneuvering behind the Takanami and they already got fish in the water. So to your point, Bill, the torpedoes are smacking into the sides of these American cruisers, and they're blowing the mm. bows off of these damn things left and right. The USS New Orleans, named after my hometown, loses her bow. Um, mm. USS Minneapolis takes a punishing here as well. Um, as I recall, North Minneapolis also had a aviation gas fire, and we talked so. a lot about that at Savo, where we didn't... You know, we thought we had learned this lesson where you're going to take that ad gas off the ship because it's going to turn your ship into an inferno. Yep. But somehow Minneapolis didn't do that and ends up having their aviation gasoline light up again. Yeah. And, and it's it's kind of, you know, second verse, same as the first. Oh, and, and we forgot you said the Northampton takes a torpedo and blows her bow off, too. You know, mm -hmm. the, these are these are ships that are, you know, you, you talk about the, the av gas fires at Savo. And we talked about that. And. You know, we talked about, you know, when the discovery of the wrecks of the American cruisers from Savo were, were found that, you know, all their bows are gone. And it's like it's like a glass jaw. It's like a weak point in the design. Mm -hmm. The same thing happens here. The New Orleans, the Minneapolis, these are all New Orleans. They're all cruisers of the same class. So and they all have this like fracture point up near the bow. Now, granted, a long yeah. lance is going to put a licking on just about anything, but still. And it wasn't just this class. If Forgive me for doing this. I do this all the time, but jump ahead to 1945 to the Indianapolis Portland mm -hmm. class cruiser. Right. Lost her bow with the first torpedo off of I-58. But And those sailors all knew that these older cruisers, no, older cruisers, these other classes of cruisers had lost their bows too. Mm -hmm. So... I was witness to debates in the 2000s between various crew members on the Indianapolis. Some saying, oh, I saw that we lost the bow. Others saying, no, we didn't lose the bow. You know, you're thinking of Northampton or whatever. Yeah. And indeed, the Indianapolis did lose the bow. In that case, we didn't know that until we didn't know that for sure until 2017 when the ship was discovered at the bo bottom of the Philippine Sea. But it's just but it's, it's a perennial problem. You're right. Yeah, it is. It's a perennial problem. And and at the end of the day, you know, and again, you know, we're not going to get deep into the weeds on Tassa Faranga because there's some other things we want to wrap up mm -hmm. about Guadalcanal. But this is an extremely it's like nobody nobody learned the lesson here. You know, I mean, you Savo was a surprise and and a, just a, a pounding of biblical proportions. Cape aspirants, mm -hmm. we surprised them and put up pretty good lick on them you know friday the 13th mm -hmm. is this melee that we take a beating they take a beating but you know it's like there there never should have been this defeat at tassa you know 
the, we've got a new admiral in charge, Admiral Wright, who clearly didn't learn any of the lessons that that had been mm. learned the hard way at the beginning of this campaign. And it leads to, frankly, I agree with you, you know, the th- third worst defeat of the United States Navy. And they all come at the hands of the Japanese and they all come at the hands of long lance torpedoes fired by destroyers or cruisers because mm. of inept American leadership. And, and it's just it's. Mm. It's a crime. Two it's an absolute crime. Interesting footnotes, though, is that when the, the let's see, the North Northampton was sunk, but the others kind of made it back to Tulagi, to, to where they were given kind of jury rigged um, repairs that included building makeshift bows out of coconut tree trunks, if you right. can believe that. Right. So they can get to a spirit to sent to or Australia where there were more, you know, c- complete, correct repairs were conducted. So that was footnote number one. Footnote number two is when Northampton went down, one of the sailors who went swimming that was later picked up. Um, for those of you that know something about actors of the 60s and 70s was the actor Jason Robards who later was in the movie that I had something to do with called Crimson Tide and closing scene of that movie, but he's a very, very famous actor, never made a big deal of the fact he, his ship was sunk (laughs) in the Northampton, um, big deal, uh, for him, but he was a great hero. And the third footnote in 94, 95 timeframe, when I was stationed in the Pentagon on the Navy staff, I had the privilege of driving a golf cart around the Pentagon with escorting Arlie Burke. And Arlie Burke, after Tassafaranga, had standing, had given standing orders to all of his battle groups that the destroyer screen never had to ask permission (laughs) to fire their torpedoes, that they should fire when they achieved the optimum firing position without orders. So that became a, a standing order for Arleigh Burke throughout the remainder of the war. It, and if, if that standing order had been in place for this, this event likely would not have turned out the way that it did. Right. And to put to put a cap on this, just so people understand, you know, that we named all the ships that were involved here in terms of American. We had four heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, and six destroyers. We lost 395 men killed, one heavy cruiser sunk, and three heavy cruisers severely damaged. The Japanese had eight destroyers. They lost between 197 and 210 people killed and one destroyer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you know, it's it, it was a debacle of biblical proportions. The USS New Orleans, the cruiser that for which this class was named, you know, the, the Astoria, the Quincy, the Vincennes, uh, you know, all, all these ones that were sunk. Um, of course, San Francisco is the hero oh. of, the, of the group, but mm-hmm. no, yeah, right. Not all of them, but, but the, you know, a great majority, um, mm-hmm. the new Orleans, you know, had her bow blown off. And as you said, Bill, they had coconut log false bow was built to keep her afloat until she could re- receive temporary repairs An ironic little kind of a little nugget of history is that she sailed backwards from, um, Australia all the way back to Puget sound to so as to not force enough water through her pile she sailed backwards all the way back to the united states for permanent repairs so that's kind of an oddball little nugget no, not of, of fun <laughs> no you're <laughs> taking a, the bridge lines. yeah <laughs> taking a hell of a long time too you know mm-hmm. i don't know what her uh her speed was in reverse but i can guarantee it wasn't no. as fast as it was would not have been fast. going in flank yeah, yeah. but it's 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 a crying shame that the way that things turned out for tassa Faranga and you know, we're going to talk about as we as we evolve the podcast and as we move into different areas of the Pacific War, we're going to continue to talk about naval battles because, uh, like you, I enjoy talking about good old fashioned gunfights. And there's several of them that that, that come up. You know, uh, Kula Golf is one. You know, there's all these different little small naval actions that you know a lot of people don't know about that that I do want to dive into, and I know we want to talk about. But um, this would be one of those areas where lessons you would have thought would have been learned and just they just they just mm-hmm. weren't. You know, and 
you know, we consistently call Guadalcanal the, the the classroom as we go along, you know, from the very first episode we did on this to now. You know, there were things that were learned the hard way at Guadalcanal that, that the Marine Corps, the Army Air Forces, the Navy, the Army all put into play later, maybe not necessarily at Guadalcanal, but for later operations. And it's one reason that that we like to call Guadalcanal the turning point, not only because it was the death of the Imperial Navy, and it really, they never, ever achieved the striking power that they had again. You know, you could say, oh, Philippines say they put a lot of carriers on the plate, but their aviators, the ones that struck Pearl Harbor, sunk Lexington at Coral Sea, sunk Yorktown at Midway, sunk the Hornet, they're gone. You know, the vast, not all of them, but the vast majority of them are gone. And and, and they, they still have never got they beat. still have Yamato and Musashi, oh, yeah. but they never really do anything with them. Musashi gets involved a little bit in the Philippines, but um, yeah, and then gets sunk. <laughs> Yamato yeah. gets sunk later. But you're right, from the carrier naval aviation standpoint, this is the swan song for, for a great deal of the Japanese Navy. So, you know, one of the big takeaways, the takeaway, <laughs> takeaways, the takeaway, one of the big takeaways from the Guadalcanal campaign is, yeah, we captured the island of Guadalcanal and that starts the, the offensive and allows us to do a lot of different things. But from the Japanese perspective, it, it, you know, and we talked about this with John multiple times, it's just this mm -hmm. manpower suck that just, you know, just sucks all their, their quality veteran aviators into the abyss that they never really come out of, you know, I mean, they're, and this is like, for me, this is the big takeaway from the battle of Santa Cruz was that, you know, they are never able to replicate the quality nor the quantity of quality aviators after that for the rest of the war. You know, they don't have the training regimen. They don't have the school system that we had in the United States at that time to do that, to build a force, you know, and I think, you know, one of the questions we got on YouTube, I think it was during Eastern Solomon's, that episode was like, well, why, you know, why didn't, why didn't the Japanese do this? And why didn't they establish these long-term training programs like we had here in the States? And I think it was mainly because they didn't expect the war to last that long. Exactly. Yamamoto's strategy from the beginning was hit them hard, convince them that this is an unsustainable war for the United States and get them to capitulate. So yeah. they were not planning on this war lasting from 41 to 45. Mm -hmm. And clearly, you know, they didn't have the systems in place to allow that to happen for them. No. And they just kept throwing, you know, men into the meat grinder that was Guadalcanal. And it just, it, it devastated everything that they had in terms of aviation. And when you look at the Pacific, that is what drives everything. Yeah. The Marine Corps. Yeah. The battleships. And it's the carriers, yeah. man, it's the carriers and, and, and it's aviation and it's the people. And, and, and especially in the South Pacific, it's the, the, the airfields like Munda. And of course, you know, Anderson field too, but Munda, New Georgia, places, like that, that 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 just extend this aerial umbrella that we have, we being the allies, that the Japanese just they can't make up for it anymore because of Absolutely. events like Santa Cruz, you know. Well, in industry in the 90s, this concept called just in time supply chain became all the rage because it's very efficient. You don't have to warehouse and things like that. But when lives are at stake, just in time is not appropriate. And the Japanese were essentially resorting to just in time population of pilots and equipment and supplies and things like that. And it does not work in combat. It doesn't. And you mean, um, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm thumbing through a, a, a book right now. I'm trying to find this specific table that I, that I know I know exists and damn it, if I can find it, but it's, it's the amount of losses that the Japanese suffered in terms of air in, in terms of, of aviation. Here it is right here. Um, just from August through November, keep this in mind now. Now, the Japanese did not have a large naval aviation force to begin with. You know, we think of this massively powerful force, and it was, but it had a core group of aviators on those six carriers that hit Pearl Harbor, and that was really it. You know, they had they had trained some new guys in there, but even they were not the quality of those ones at 41, early 42. Mm -hmm. By the end of the campaign, there are Aircraft losses from the Japanese are going to be, this is staggering, 
The following table, and this is from Richard Frank's Guadalcanal book, the following table represents the best figures available in Imperial Navy aircraft losses from all causes from August 1st to November 15th, 1942. There are 198 carrier aircraft that are lost. There are 243 aircraft from the 11th Air Fleet that are lost. And the rear area, there are four, further 46 aircraft that are lost, totaling a total of five. 107 aircraft that the Japanese lost in and around the area of Guadalcanal from August through November 1942. I mean, that is that is a tremendous amount, not just of machinery, but of human beings, because mm -hmm. it's not, we're not just talking about just one guy and a zero. We're talking about guys that are in cates and valves, you know, multiple multi-crew position aircraft. I mean, that's tremendous. Now, on the flip side of that, we lost like something like, um, now this includes aircraft carrier, uh, Naval Aviation Forces, guys flying from the Cactus Air Force, uh, PBYs and things like that, 480 aircraft, which is nothing to sneeze at either, mind you. I know. <laughs> you know, saying is how the Japanese lost 507, we lost 480. Well, that's not a whole hell of a lot of a difference. But the thing is, we could make it up. The Japanese could not. We had the industrial capacity and yeah. they did not. And again, bringing it back to lessons that we need to, to keep in mind as we move forward, not just look at it from a historical standpoint, but from the going forward standpoint, the shipyard industrial base, the aircraft manufacturing industrial base that we had in World War II doesn't exist anymore. Right. We had over 50 shipyards building ships during World War II. We've got less than 20 now. Mm -hmm. One modern shipyard in China has more capacity than all 20 of the shipyards in the United States combined. Mm -hmm. So that worked for us in World War II, the ability to say, we're going to make up for those losses and Japan can't, and it's going to get better. You know, we'll give us time and we'll, we'll be able to make this right. In the future, that's not true. All those advantages that the United States had in the 1940s are advantage China today. And that's one of the things we really got to keep in mind based on the current world situation. Yeah, and then that's indisputable too. I mean, I mean, you go to a store today, and everything, every damn near everything you buy is made in China, and because nothing is right. made in the United States hardly at all anymore. But that's yeah. another conversation for another day. Another conversation. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but, but your point but it's very is very true, though. And again, we're repeating the the point that Japan did not plan for this to be a multi year war. Yeah. They were really banking on it, us capitulating, and didn't contemplate the possibility that we wouldn't and and even yamamoto knew mm -hmm. that if we didn't capitulate that there was no way they could win this war yep and it, it just goes to it that comes to fruition obviously on the decks of the missouri mm -hmm. but i mean the thing is is that they knew in 42 that's why they called off the japanese you know offenses on guadalcanal that they had continually planned to do they were you know continuing to throw meat into the meat grinder and they were finally like right. That's enough. You know, we've had enough of this. We got to do something else. And and it's because it's just wasn't working. And if you look at 43, 1943, that we're going to get into the loss mm -hmm. on Guadalcanal and, you know, in the air and all over the place, you know, the ships, the aircraft, especially the aircraft and the people, because Japanese had a huge army. They had a lot of people scattered all over the globe, but their aircraft. A lot in China still. Oh yeah, tons in China, but but their aircraft in terms of in naval, China. Yep. yeah, yeah, the, the the that core group of naval aviators, it, which is what propels the war in the Pacific, one way or the other, right. is is gone, and and that dictates everything that the Japanese are going to do in the year 1943. Literally everything, you know, because if if you look at some of the actions, and I know we're going to talk about. They don't venture that they don't bring that fleet out like they did. They don't sally forth from, you know, their bases to come engage the American fleet mm -hmm. for numerous reasons, not the least of which is they don't have the people with the skill set to do the job and think that they can perform well and get out of the situation victorious. And this right. is all because of Guadalcanal, all of it, every single bit of it. On the flip side of that, the United States we are and our allies we are able to build this process of you know we always we talked about the the uh, island hopping campaign which we're going to get into in the latter part of 1943 starting with tarawa mm -hmm. and getting you know going further and further but 
it, you know, there's a lot of war still to be fought in the South Pacific where you'll hear Admiral Halsey's name again. You're going to hear our old friend Douglas MacArthur's name, you know, in New Guinea, in uh, uh, New Georgia, New Britain, you know, places like that that we're going to talk about. But all of this stems from the victory on Guadalcanal. And if, you know, when we go into some of these islands and we talk about some of these operations, it's all South Pacific. And it all is because of the victory at Guadalcanal. So everything that mm -hmm. comes from uh Everything that happens after February 1943 is, frankly, as a result of the American and Allied victory on and around and above Guadalcanal. Bringing this full circle, I, we repeat that this was King's baby. It Admiral was. King um, kind of jammed it through the Joint Chiefs of Staff, even telling Marshall, we're going to do this with or without the Army. Yeah. And while it was bloody and painful, it was the schoolhouse. Yeah. where we learned how to do everything that we would need to know to do to win the war. And it was strategic imperative. And mm -hmm. so it, the victory in this long and bloody campaign, as you said, enabled everything to follow. So he was right. Oh, yeah, no doubt. And and you're going to hear when we when we start talking about Tarawa and we start, start talking about New Guinea, we're actually going to kind of go back in time because we're going to talk about some of the actions that occurred in New Guinea in 1942. But you're going to hear consistent references to Guadalcanal. And there's a reason for mm -hmm. that. And it's not just because I like to say it. It's because, you know, everything stems from this. And, and that's why mm -hmm. we spent so much time on it, because it is every single thing in every event that happened from the landing on August 7th until Admiral Willis Lee shot the living bejesus out of the Japanese on Washington. Mm -hmm. Everything influences every other thing that happens after that everything which you can't really say that about a lot of the other pacific battles you really can't right a lot of them are essentially stand out standalones you can call them one off or whatever yeah this affects everything yeah 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 well great well so i was going to say you know we're not we're not wrapping this podcast up by any means at all we're gonna we're gonna change formats for this is for the listeners and the viewers as we go forward because there are some events that we want to talk about that are going to take a lot of time and 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 for those who who don't know uh the office behind me is not my office in my house this is my actual office we do have work to do i do actually yeah. have a job we do this we record these on my lunch break so you know to just to give you guys you know some sort of an idea here so that my point in all this is it's not saying you know boohoo or anything like that because we want to keep doing this we love it i love it i know bill we we both enjoy talking about yeah. this but yeah. we want to talk about some different things we want to get into some different areas of of interest you know, we like I said, we want to do New Guinea. We want to talk about the air war over the Solomons. These are all things that are coming. Um, we definitely want to talk about submarines. And, you know, while everything for Guadalcanal has been very chronological and that, that was done on purpose, because, like I said, everything influences everything else. Um, this next group of, of episodes that we're going to do is not necessarily going to be chronological, I don't think, Bill, because I know we want to talk about submarines. Mm -hmm. We've We've yeah. recorded it in an episode with Admiral Fargo, uh, Thomas Fargo, mm -hmm. you know, it, it talks about American Pacific Fleet submarines that we're going to air very soon. We want to talk about, you know, Pacific submarine strategy when it comes to like Mush Morton and Oahu and Tang and uh, Eugene Flukey and you know, all kinds, all these. Lockwood, Admiral Lockwood's influence. Yeah, Charlie Lockwood, and, yeah. And, and how Nimitz understood kind of organically the impact that the submarine force would have. Yeah, and as well as carriers, and not to ignore the surface combatants because there's a lot of that going forward as well. Absolutely, and of course, the island hopping campaigns, island by island by island, as we creep closer and closer to the Empire of Japan. Now, you're right, Seth. You know, for the listeners and viewers, Seth is 20 years younger than I am, and I'm semi-retired. But this pace that we've been doing, where we're recording an hour and a half to two hours every week is even you know weighs on me as well and i can't imagine having to do this while handling a nine to five job which i did give up before we began this podcast <laughs> doesn't mean I'm, i've stopped working but my nine to five job has is, is been set aside so season two logically begins in 1943. absolutely absolutely and we're gonna you know 
we're producing high quality material, you know, from all the reviews and comments. And we thank you very, very much that, that we, we are, we're bringing good history and, and we want to continue to do that. And we really want to dive deep in a lot of these little areas of the war that people don't talk about. Everybody knows about Tarawa and Iwo Jima and all this, stuff, and we'll get there, but we want to talk about the Kokoda track. We want to talk about, you know, Mush Morton. We want to talk about Richard Bong and people like that and different things. So we're going to so take a little worry, more time. I worry that everybody doesn't know about Tarawa and Iwo Jima anymore. That's also very and true. So, and so this is why I'm so um, animated and energized by the podcast because, you, you know, for some people, there's maybe a little bit too much detail. If so, they can skip through it. <laughs> Something you couldn't do by watching an old TV show, right? That's Streaming right. is wonderful in that regard. Yeah. But hopefully it brings it a lot of information to people who wouldn't otherwise know. And, right. and that's really what we're trying to do with this that's podcast. Right. That's 100 percent right. And I think, you know, I, we don't have an episode list laid out in our well, I got kind of one in my head and Bill and I've talked about we don't have it on paper yet. And we're going to get there here in the next couple of days, probably over email. But um you know, expect some new cool things coming up, you know, not just New Guinea, but we're going to do a lot of submarines. I want to talk about submarines. I know Bill is frothing at the mouth to talk about submarines, and <laughs> rightfully so, because it's cool, man. You know, people think, you know, ship killers and they're thinking SPDs and, and and you know, mm -hmm. Sir Gow Strait, and, and, which is true. It's good stuff. Over 50% mm -hmm. of well, Japanese kills were done by submarines. You so. knew... You, you knew so many of the heroes that got in, in the battles that we've talked about so far. I knew several of the surviving submarine commanders, and I wouldn't say I was friends with them, but I met Dick O'Kane and had conversations with George Street and Gene Flucky and, and, and got friendly with uh, Edward Beach. And so that's my contribution from the personal conversation standpoint you have had hundreds of those i've only had a few but they're almost all submariners and that's so damn cool is because those guys there were a couple that were i got close to and by close to mm -hmm. i mean like i close to getting to know them and they unfortunately passed away george street was one of them but you know i never knew okane and and you know okane mm -hmm. Personally, I know his son. I haven't spoken to him in years, but I know Jim O'Kane. And O'Kane's one of my personal heroes because that guy was just an unbelievable warrior. Just unbelievable. When we talk about Flucky, people will not be able to believe the stories we're going to be able to tell. Oh, a man, submarine that wait. sunk a train. Can yeah. you believe that? <laughs> what other submarine sunk a train? Yeah. We, we're going to be able to reveal a lot about that. I can't wait. I can't wait to get into it because, I mean, you know, the submariners, mm -hmm. the silent service of the Pacific fleet, they were a lot of them were like pirates. <laughs> you and know, as we might in a good way <laughs> previously. Yeah. The highest fatality rate in all of the armed forces on the American side during World War II, higher even than the daylight bombing um, the Army Air Forces people in Europe. And the, the Air Force, yeah. submarine force in the Pacific, we lost 52 submarines. And unlike when the Northampton went down, for example, when a submarine goes down, it generally takes all hands. Yeah. So there was no escape. Yeah. Uh, Dick, Dick O'Kane's ship being the exception. Yeah, well, one of the very, very few for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, so so if you're looking looking forward to season two, like like we both are, you know, think about New Guinea, Solomon's Air Campaign, submarines out the wazoo. And I got a I got a strong feeling we're gonna we're gonna wrap up that season. Uh, second season with uh, a little little place on a beach on an island called Badio in the Tarawa Atoll in November 1943, mm -hmm. fittingly. So um, I just so far as we wrap up season one and prepare for season two, I personally want to thank all you guys. You know, when Bill and I first started this project, you know, we always had in the back of our mind, is anybody really going to watch? Is anybody really mm -hmm. going to listen? And I, I, I kept telling myself, like, yeah, they will. They will. It'll take time. And we it's thought true. it would last yeah. a month or two. And yeah. we started talking about this when we were both on the Fox New Fox Nation eight episode series, um, The Lost Ships of World War II. And I thought, ah, it'll be a nice, you know. It'll be fun. Rest yeah. it, it'll last a month or two. And then when nobody watches and listens, we'll say, well, that was fun, but it's over. To our surprise. Yeah. People actually watching and listening. So yeah. I guess we need to continue it. 
we're definitely going to continue it and uh you know we'll 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 start putting out a it might be kind of cool you know to, to kind of and we might do this i'm not saying we will but we might do this might put something out and just say hey guys you know um what do you want to hear about that happened in the year 1943 1942 and we can build something on that not not a lot because we get like you know a ton of comments on things that we could never possibly cover everything but you know mm -hmm. kind of a kind of a, a a listener inquiry kind of a thing might be kind of cool too so but to, anyway regardless of that um bill you want to put a bow on this no season one seth had a great time with you and look forward to season two absolutely same here and, and uh, uh, you know like I said, you're 20 years younger than me it's been difficult for me to keep up with you but i i'm trying my best uh, we're all we're <laughs> we, we take it as we can get it bill <laughs> right it's, it's been difficult for me to keep up but we're rocking and rolling and we will definitely get back at this very soon so with that I want to thank you very much for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast wherever you receive your podcast. Give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. Also, if you want to see the video version of this and any of our other episodes from season one, please subscribe to our YouTube channel called the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. Look us up on Facebook, like and subscribe to our page there as well. Send us a message there. We hardly ever get any traffic on Facebook for whatever reason. I frankly do not know, okay. but we don't. Not on YouTube. No. Yeah, we do. We get a ton on YouTube and I'm very grateful for that. But if you mm -hmm. are so inclined, send us a send us a message on Facebook or our email, which is unauthorized Pacific podcast at gmail.com with any comments or questions. Uh, we're going to wrap up this season one here. We got to edit and produce these things and get them out. And then we will be back very, very soon with season two with some new exciting material covering the rest of the Pacific War 1943 before we get into the absolute bloodletting of 44 and 45. And with that, I want to thank you very much. My name is Seth Perrin, uh, and we will see you very soon, Bill. And I'm Bill Toady. Thanks for watching and listening. Yep. And we will see you guys on season two coming up very soon. Thanks.